Obviously, we're all teachers. We all encounter amazing kinds of challenges to deal with. And one of them is getting, um, you know, how to deal with somebody who might be stuck in some kind of a rut. We have to look at the way they practice. It's our responsibility to guide them in terms of the best ways of practicing. Because we all know that so often the student simply does the same thing over and over and over again. And one of the challenges that I enjoy the most is looking for ways of getting students to think differently. And I love thinking in as crazy a manner as possible. So I look for ways of having them practice in a, in a manner that is diametric opposite, diametrically opposite to what they're trying to accomplish. And that's where I came up with the uh, term of principles of paradoxical practicing. Okay, basically, it, the, the, the basic premise of it is something that I picked up from a commercial a number of years ago from Kellogg's Corn Flakes. When they were losing market share, uh, they came up with a line that I think is the best jingle ever. Kellogg's Corn Flakes, taste them again for the first time. If there is some way that we can practice the same thing again, as if for the first time, to approach it differently, if the, the end result is, is what you know, we know we're after, but if we can approach it differently, and oftentimes the diametric opposite, uh, I think it's very useful. Okay, so we want to basically look for new challenges, new and different challenges, to, uh, to avoid taking our practice routine for granted. So I've got some wide-ranging ideas. I'll try to get through as many of them as I can. Um, one thing very, very generally, and this is more on the part of the teacher uh, making decisions about repertoire, obviously we want to take our students to the finest repertoire. We know who the finest composers are. We know that Schumann wrote these wonderful pieces, uh, scenes from childhood and the album for the young. But very often, it is the great composers who write the music that is really awkward because they're breaking new ground. And we all know how awkward, for example, Schumann can be. So I think if we were to look not right away for music of the great composers, but music of, forgive me for saying this, second-rate composers, third-rate composers. Now, that that's a bad term to use, but people who are not, they wouldn't be taught in uh, the piano literature, you know, where you can only talk about the, uh, the most important ones. So, uh, say if you're working toward um, Schumann pieces, which again, we know can be very awkward. If we look at music people by people like Heller, I mean, this musically, it is, it's not the same thing as Schumann, but because so many of these composers are derivative, so many of these big quotation marks, lesser composers have in mind these great composers and they themselves are so clever that they can take these great ideas but create their own what are often simpler, more approachable, technically, musically more approachable. I think that can be very useful. Um, okay, memory security, and forgive me for talking fast. Oftentimes I will ask a student, do you ever have the music open when you're memorizing? No, they just, they, they close the music, they see how far they can get, and then if something goes wrong, they open up the music. Well, I think that's completely wrong. I tell them, use the music at all times. So often that we find a student gets to a point where they cannot even play the piece looking at the music. Something is wrong there. So I'm always encouraging them to be able to actively read the music when they're memorizing. Wrong hand practicing. And again, most of this you've heard already, I think, but putting it all under one umbrella. Uh, we want to practice hands alone. We want to memorize hands alone. Try doing music for each hand using the other hand. It can, it can be absolutely revelatory. Obviously, you're not concerned about fingering. You want to actively go against muscle memory. So it really makes you think a lot harder. Um, there are times where you can take, say, Chopin Nocturne um, uh, left hand and practice it and memorize it this way using two hands. You gotta be kidding. <laughs> okay, working backwards in a piece. That's not a new idea, but that's, that's very, very important. And when you chunk a piece, doing it out of order, uh, doing the sections out of order. Don't always do it the same way. Learn how to read ahead. Okay, using a metronome. Obviously when we use a metronome, we try to play along with the tick. 
Oftentimes, I have found students slip off the beat and they land on the middle of the beat and they stay there beautifully. <laughs> Seriously. So that can be a very, I mean, try it, you'll discover a lot with that. Um, okay. The last thing I want to talk about in 10 seconds is the idea of pausing. I'm going to go to my grave espousing pausing and trying to get the students to think in terms of chunks, of small pieces, and intentionally